and here's the far end of that, which you wouldn't necessarily want to do this, but this is my lowest velocity. So it's like right in front of your face. It's playing back those low velocity ones super loud. And then the high velocity ones are basically the same volume level, even though it's brighter because it's the different samples. Oh, well, that's the other one, but it just really makes them right in front of your face, which can be useful. But like I said, in moderation, I think is the best, uh, is like kind of the best point. And it really helps to keep the piano nice and present when you want it to be in down sections without front of house having to like always be riding like your fader or something like that to keep you in the mix. It's a nice way to kind of like avoid having to do that. Now, I also do run, I do run compression on the piano sound too, because again, it does, uh, the other thing that compression can do is it can add a lot of sustain to your piano sound, which is nice. Um, again, not that you would always want to run a ton of compression on your piano sounds, but I'd, at least lately, it, more of a stylistic thing is in worship music, a lot of piano sounds are pretty heavily compressed. Uh, it's just kind of like, I guess, a phase that worship music is in. And I, I like it, though. I'm not, like, I'm not ragging on it. It does, it gives a lot of extra sustain to the sound because it can, uh, you know, like I said, once, once the input gain on the compression hits a certain point called the threshold, it starts to, what it does is compresses the audio. So it, it, it pushes back on the audio coming in once it hits a certain point. And then what you can do is you boost the output signal back up so that it sits in like a, a comparable range. But what that does is it also brings up all of that, the long sustain, like it brings up the tail end of those like samples. Whereas what I was doing before would really just bring the samples themselves louder. Uh, the compression would help those, like the sustain of each of those notes last longer. So it kind of stays more present for a longer amount of time. And I'll kind of show you what's going on there just to give you the details of the piano sound. Now, the other thing too is don't, like it is very easy to overdo compression. So it kind of comes like with a warning at the same time. Um, and there, I'm not gonna get too in the nitty gritty of like how to dial in settings of compression. And it's also important to be in communication with front of house too, because if they're gonna be running uh, compression on your piano sounds or whatever from front of house, it can also st stack up pretty quick and you don't want to end up with too much by the time if you're putting a ton on here, he's putting some on back there. Before you know it, you actually have lost all of your dynamic range because it's so compressed that everything, that when you want to get big, it's actually not big because everything's just slamming back on, on how hard you're playing. Kind of makes sense? So this is another thing that I do is if you, um, this is like a little bit more of like, I guess a production technique, but I actually do two, uh, not all the time, but sometimes I like to stack compressors a little bit, each of them doing just a little bit of work. Uh, so sometimes if you try to get the, like the amount of sustain from the compression that you want, it almost makes that one compressor work too hard and you get too much of the characteristics of that compressor out of it. Um, so maybe like if you're using, um, I don't know what a good example would like, you know, a super like snappy compressor. If you want it to have the sustain, you'd have to really drive like the compression on a little more and it's just gonna like really squash the attack too much. But if you stack two of them doing like both a little bit of work, it'll bring up the sustain of both of them and you don't have to like make one compressor work really hard and get too much of the tonal characteristics out of just the one. So here's kind of like where for the most part, things will kind of end up as you get. So like with that chord, you have a nice good bit of sustain. It's also getting a little louder as I boost, like I have <coughs> the output, like the overall volume of what's happening is also getting a little louder. But you can hear like the tail of that chord dies off a little faster, even though it's quieter. Like you can just hear it has a little less sustain to it versus when I throw just a little bit of compression on two different compressors stacked with each other. Like you can tell it just stays a little more present a little bit longer. Make sense? Yeah, those are actually just compressors, like compressor plugins that come straight, like straight out of main stage. And there are, it's actually really nice. Main stage comes with different models of, of um, like if you really wanted to get into it. 
it comes with all sorts of different models. Like if you want it, this is like an 1176 emulation. Um, I believe this one would be, where is it? Uh, this would be, I'm trying to remember, I think this might be like the LA-2A emulation, I'm pretty sure. Um, so it's got like different, I mean, they're kind of meant to look like the ones that they emulate, but um, but this would be like your 1176, like super snappy, super strong. That's doing a ton of, like, that's doing a ton of work there, but um, anyway. So does that kind of make sense? Like, that's how I use a little bit of like the effects on a piano sound, just to help it sit nice and present. Like without, like you still get, you can still get the dynamic range from like the brightness of like, of the samples getting nice and bright, but you, you also want things to be able to stay present like in low moments when you want them to without having to make front of house run a bunch of like, you know, ride your fader a bunch. Make sense? Um, now the other thing I also want to hit on as far as effects on like sounds go, <coughs> You can use, so like I will hit a little bit of, uh, we'll talk reverb for a second. So um, reverb is obviously like an amazing tool to use as far as like an effect goes to really help uh, create space in a song and like, and I guess in some ways really fill space in a song. Um, it's also really easy to overdo. So you wanna be careful with it. One thing to be careful about is that a lot of, um, a lot of reverbs can get really swimmy, but if you're, if you're, if you're not careful enough about where they get swimmy, like as far as their low end, it can get really muddy really quick. Um, so you wanna be careful about what reverbs you use and how you process those reverbs because it's not a bad thing inherently, but if you've got a lot of low, mid, low end, swimmy stuff like coming from your reverb, it's just gonna end up sounding like complete mud all the time. Um, and that doesn't do anybody any good and you're gonna lose all of the clarity from what you're playing in the front of house mix. So. It's a great tool, you just wanna be careful about how you're kinda of dialing in the sound. Um, a lot of times what I will do is, where's, um, I mean there's different ways to run reverb too. Uh, you can run reverb on your actual channel strip, like which basically means I have a reverb plugin on my piano channel strip that would, I can play with the mix on the reverb so that I have like less of the dry signal, more of the wet. The only slight disadvantage to that is that you end up losing some of the dry signal as you dial in the reverb. Uh, but sometimes that ends up not being a bad thing as far as it doesn't make your volume fluctuate as much because as you're losing some of the dry, you're getting like, you're obviously getting more of the wet signal. So it also ends up evening out your, like, your signal a little bit. But sometimes it's better to run it on a bus, which means you would send the audio from the dry signal over to a different channel strip that's running just a completely wet reverb and then be able to dial that in and out and you can use, you can control the send to the reverb so that you're actually dialing in the amount of reverb based on how much of the dry signal you're sending to it. So that way you don't lose the dry signal as you increase the mix of how much reverb you have. Sometimes that's a better way to approach it. It just kind of depends. Um, <clears throat> but as far as um, like, as far as kind of like demonstrating some of what I'm talking about, I, like I'll stick with our reckless love example. Um, there's also different kinds of reverbs. I'm sure you guys know this, but uh, another one that's been pretty popular for a while. I actually think it's pretty overused, in my personal opinion, but it can be useful still. Is like a shimmer reverb type of effect. It's kind of like a reverb that um, that creates an octave up reverb from where you're actually playing. So it kind of, I don't know the ins and outs of how it works, but that's basically what's happening is it's pitching up the audio content and then creating reverb based on like the octave above what you're playing. Um, and the more feedback you have on it, the more that it kind of creates like reverb in those higher frequency, higher octaves. Um, but I'll, show, I'll demonstrate some of like what I'm talking about just with how you can really bring you can really bring parts to life if you dial in effects in like a in a um, in a smart way. So here's here's reckless love, dry piano, no layered stuff too. So that was the other thing is um, when I was talking about I love the idea of bringing in different samples on the top end of the keyboard. So you know I was using that CP80 sound earlier. I'm going to take it off for now. So this is literally just piano. Even on the top end, it's the same sample. So if I play Reckless Love 
uh, I'll play it in C because that's we play it in the female key a lot. But here's what it sounds like, just dry, if you were playing just normal piano sound. So nothing wrong with that. Like, it sounds fine, sure. But to really, there's like, I'll show you each stage of kind of what I've been talking about to really try to bring this thing to life. So first thing I'll do is I've got this one set up. I've got like a reverb plugin uh, running on the channel strip. And so I'm just going to dial in the mix of that a little bit, only to about like, I don't know, 20%, something like that. And already you'll, like, you'll, heal, you'll hear the amount of space that it kind of like, it starts to take up a little more space, but it also fills out the sound nicely uh, and kind of helps it like, helps it feel bigger than what it was before. So here's that. So it already starts to sound bigger than it was before. It's taken up more space, which isn't necessarily always the best thing, but in this case, like if I'm trying to really make this sound exp expansive and full, that's like stage one. Uh, the other thing I'll do is I'll stack on a little bit of shimmer reverb on top of it. <clears throat> so yeah, there's actually gonna be two reverbs running on this thing. Uh, again, everything in moderation too. You, it's really easy to overdo. But what this will do is it actually helps bring out a little bit of extra high frequency content from a reverb standpoint and kind of helps the thing, for lack of a better word, shimmer a little bit, kind of come a little more to life. Here's what it sounds like. Like it's kind of got a nice, it almost sounds like there's a pad underneath it that's got a little bit of that like brightness to it, but it helps it come to life just a little bit. And then the last thing would be the, the other thing we talked about, which would be kind of stacking or layering another sound on top of it. Here's the same thing I just played with the added CP80 uh, layer just on the top end of the keyboard to bring just that lead portion to life a little bit. So like all of a sudden it sounds like pretty like that part comes out really nice because it's only really up on the top end of the keyboard. You've got like richness and fullness. Uh, it's filling up like a good amount of space. It doesn't, it's, you don't lose the intelligibility of the part. Like if I overdo the reverb, all of a sudden it just sounds like a swimmy mess. Like that's, to him, that's going to be so useless because it's literally going to sound like you just put me in like the biggest chamber and you were listening from like a mile away in the same room. That's basically what that sounds like. So that's not going to be useful at all. Like if he tries to bring that to the forefront, you just get noise in the room and then you lose all sorts of clarity. So everything in moderation is going to be really important when you do this kind of stuff. Again, reverb is like a great tool. It's an amazing effect to like to have at hand. Uh, and it can really bring parts to life, but just make sure that you don't overdo it. It's easy to overdo too. Um, and again, in contrast, this is where it started. And you kind of dial things in. Pretty big difference, it like I, in my head helps the part really come to life, um, and like fills a good bit more space. Like helps you really make that section of the song go from like feeling big to feeling even just a little bigger. Make sense? The other thing to be aware of too is, uh, you know, sometimes it makes sense to dial and reverb in the biggest parts of songs, but sometimes it almost helps, kind of again from a front of house standpoint, to start to dial back your reverbs a little bit in bigger sections because of that same reason, which is as everybody's kind of engaging and kicking in and filling out their own sound, you're gonna lose some of that intelligibility of parts and some of that clarity. So sometimes it helps to actually be aware of when it makes sense. Maybe in down parts, you can have a little more reverb present, like maybe that bridge of what a beautiful name. You've got a good bit of reverb there. It kind of gives a nice depth of feel to the sound, like it makes the sound feel less like right in front of your face. It makes it feel like it's sitting way back in like a nice deep big room. But then if you leave that amount of reverb on there, you may not even 
you might lose all the clarity of that part happening as the rest of the band comes in. So maybe as you're playing the part, you kind of dial back the reverb a little bit and you bring back a little bit more of the dry signal just so that part stays present in the mix. You can still leave the reverb on, but maybe just like be, be aware of when it's like, oh, maybe I need to dial back so it doesn't end up too, like, you know, too cavernous, too swimmy in sections. Make sense? Tracking with me? Cool. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, this is still, it's a different patch, yeah, but it is, um, it is still just the grander. So, again, that's one of my favorite go-to, like, grand piano sounds. Um, and that's maybe something we can talk about, too, just briefly, is it helps as a keys player to be uh, aware or maybe knowledgeable on the different kinds of sounds that are at your disposal. Um, so, you know understand and know when it makes sense maybe to use grand pianos versus upright pianos versus um, electric grand pianos like the CP80 versus electric pianos like a Rhodes or a Wurlitzer. Um, you know, sometimes it makes sense to maybe not play piano at all and it makes sense, thank you. And it makes sense to maybe just play like an organ sound. Um, there's different kind of organ, there's pipe organs, there's tone wheel or like B3 organs, there are uh, like there's just so many sound, and then that's not even hitting on anything synth-wise. Um, but you know, as a keys player, like I would just be aware of and learn what kind of timbres each of those sounds carry, so that if you're either doing a new song or you hear something in a song that you're trying to learn, you instantly can say like, oh, I can tell like, okay, this song would be great to have upright, you know, like a little darker upright sound, or hey, this would be awesome to have. Like a, if it's a young and free song, maybe it's like a really bright, compressed grand piano sound or something like that, you know? So uh, that kind of stuff is also gonna be your best friend, just being aware of what kind of sounds you have like at your hand. Um, one thing I also, this is shifting gears a little bit, <clears throat> as far as synth goes, uh, some of you may be familiar with this already, but I wanna hit on the idea of envelopes really quick, because it's gonna be really important as far as sound design goes, understanding what they do, how it changes a sound, a synth sound. I'm gonna cover that in a second. So, let's start with, I'm actually gonna start with like a, an initialized patch. So, and I'm gonna use a plugin I've been using a lot. It's gonna be that same Juno emulation that I was showing you, this plugin here, except I'm gonna start from scratch. And I'm gonna build like a very quick, very basic, um, pad sound. So I'm gonna pull up an instance of this really quick and I'm gonna kinda demonstrate what envelopes on, like, and every synth plugin is gonna have, is gonna have some kinda like envelope at hand. Um, so you can, Typically, this section here, you'll see these four letters uh, as far as the envelope generators go, and it's like it'll almost always say ADSR on it. Those four letters stand for attack, decay, sustain, and release. And what they do, the envelope, think of it as literally being the thing that controls uh, the shaping of the sound, both from like an amplitude or like a volume standpoint, and also can be used applied towards the filter control on a sound as well. So that being the envelope shaping the motion of the cutoff on the filter as it like, and I'll explain kind of what I'm talking about, but you can have it apply both to the volume of the synth sound and as well as the, the cutoff on the filter of the synth sound. So <clears throat> here's like our starting sound. Sounds just like that, which is beautiful. Uh, let me try to figure out, oh, okay, hang on a second. Sounds like that. Basically, it's just like a sawtooth waveform. Like nothing interesting. You would you would probably not want to play that as like your pad sound. Nobody really wants that as a pad sound, right? So what the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about attack. I actually might, this could be helpful. Let me open a note. Uh, let me start a new note and like can I draw I don't know if I can draw, like, uh, can't you draw on these things? I'm gonna try to make it so you can, 
out of the way, but I'm not sure how to do it. Maybe I won't do this. I should have thought about this beforehand. Does anybody know how to draw on here? Add a drawing? Maybe not. What'd you say? Google image? That's a great call. Yeah, they're actually, this will just work. Um, here we go. Wow, what a beautiful thing Google is. So here, like this is a good little, this gives you a good idea of what an envelope does. So the A stands for attack, like I said. Attack is, is the, it's a time parameter. It's the amount of time before when I play a note, when the sound goes from zero, from nothing, to reaching its maximum amplitude or volume. So A stands for a time. Decay also stands for a time, and decay is the amount of time it takes to go from once the attack time has gone by and it's reached its maximum amplitude. Decay is how long it takes to decay down to the sustained level. So A, D, and R are times. The release, like attack, decay, and release are all time related. Sustain is a level. So you can kind of see if this was like the overall shaping of the sound, it would take a certain amount of the attack time to get to max, decay time to get down to the sustained level, which would be adjusting the S up and down. Uh, and then the R would be the release time after you've released the keys, how long it takes for the sound to decay to nothing. Are you guys relatively familiar with this like concept so far? I don't know if maybe some of you guys are, some of you aren't. So this is huge though, because this has to do with, you know, typically with a pad sound, you're not gonna want this kind of a sound. You're not gonna want something that just comes in blazing hot and then disappears as soon as you let go of it. You can still put, you could put reverb on that, but it's still just not gonna like function. You can filter it out. Here's like our low pass filter right here. Here's the cutoff frequency. Even if I bring this down, that's a good start. I think the sustain pedal's not working, so we're kind of cutting out on me. So like that helps it to not maybe be so like aggressive and in your face, but it's still not really gonna work as a pad sound. So let's start. Let's give it just a little bit of attack so that it doesn't come in like instantly. But one thing to be aware of when you're designing or creating pad sounds is you probably want them to at least have a relatively short attack so that it doesn't take too long for the sound to come in. Otherwise, it's almost going to sound like your pad is always lagging behind your piano. So, oh, I'm sorry. Hang on. I got to pull our sustain up first. So you can see it's kind of softening the attack of that as I bring this up. Here's like too long. So that would be too long, right? Like that would, especially if I had a piano underneath that, that would just be way too long. I would maybe dial it into about here. So it kind of like softens the blow of the attack of the sound. As far as the decay and the sustain, you know, you can maybe have a little bit of shaping where if you want the pad to come in nicely and then maybe settle just a little bit to like a slightly lower sustain. And that, you can get creative with that kind of stuff, but for now, if I turn the decay either all the way up or all the way down, you're not really going to notice because the sustain value is basically all the way up. <clears throat> but just to show you, demonstrate, so that you can like hear what exactly an envelope is doing, I'm going to pull the sustain down a good bit and then play with these values so you can hear each phase of the envelope. So we still have zero release. So when I let go of the keys, that's why the sound just disappears. So let me give it a longer attack, a long decay to a low sustain. You'll hear the sound come in kind of slow, settle back into like a low volume. Make sense? So that's kind of what's going on there. And then when I release, it just disappears. Whereas if I give this a good bit of time on the release too, it'll do the same thing, the front end. And then when I let go, you've got release time. So it doesn't just disappear when it's done. It's the amount of time it takes to go from that sustained value to zero. Make sense? So this is obviously going to be really like important in shaping your pad sounds and figuring out how to create like a decent pad sound. If I, you know, again, the decay time to like a sustain, you're, if you're going to try to create like a plucky synth sound or something, that might be really important because you're going to want that, uh, that sound to come in quick but decay to nothing or decay to a pretty low value pretty quick. So if I was trying to like, I guess for the sake of demonstration, you know, you could bring the sustain all the way down if you wanted to, so that it decays down to nothing. 
and that's and I'll bring the cutoff back up to hear it a little better, but so that's kind of a long decay, but eventually it's gone because the sustain value is set to zero. Now, if I just bring the decay down, you'll have kind of a nice little like plucky sound going because it's coming in fast with no attack and then decaying to zero pretty quick. And that's obviously exaggerated. That's real, really plucky because the decay is really short. But does that make sense? So if you're trying to make more of like a, like a plucky synth sound, the envelope's going to be your best friend. Same thing from a pad standpoint, just with different settings. Again, this is all just to do with the, the volume shaping of the, of the sound itself. So I'm going to bring our sustain back up, maybe most of the way, have a little bit of decay on it. If we wanted to have a little bit of shaping from the attack, probably not even going to notice it. And then a moderate amount of release. So I would maybe, in general, you want to be careful about how long your, again, your attack time you want to be careful about, but your release time you want to be careful about too. If the release is too long, all of your chords are going to start blending together because it's, as the last chord is trailing off, you're already on a new chord, and then before you know it, you've got this swimmy mess. So if it's too long, you end up with something kind of like this. And it's actually replacing some of those notes because the polyphony was set pretty low, so let me fix that. Like, it's all of those notes are just trailing so long even after I let go of them. That's not super useful either. So if you dial that back enough to where it has a nice even release, a little bit of attack. And then before you know it, you can kind of filter it out a little bit. And just by playing with those settings, all of a sudden you've got something that it, I'll throw a little chorus on it just to make it a little more fun. I mean, it's not necessarily like your best pad sound other. It's a little like on the synthy end of things. It's a little dry. But that maybe just with like a touch of reverb and all of a sudden like you're in a decent spot as far as a pad sound would go. Make sense? So that's something I wanted to cover because knowing how to use envelopes is going to be really crucial for you kind of shaping your pad sounds. And again, these are rules of thumb. If it's like a kind of a stock pad sound, this would maybe be a good route. But if you want, sometimes it's nice to have, again, like a pluck sound would have different envelope settings. If you're talking about maybe something cool that's really synthy, uh, I don't know if you guys, the best example off the top of my head would be a song like uh, When the Fight Calls. It's a young and free song. Uh, there's some synth stuff on that song that maybe has a nice long decay to it. It kind of comes in hot but it has a long release to it. It could be something kind of like this. So you kind of let the sound die, but I'm just kind of hitting stabs with it. So like you can kind of have more like stabby, long release kind of sounds, like that's another way. And you can create all of this stuff literally just by playing with the different envelope settings, which is pretty awesome. Also, another quick side note about the envelope section of this. Again, it looks like this in this plugin, but every, I mean, even if I open up Omnisphere, which is probably one of the most commonly used um, as far as like synth plugins goes, Omnisphere is pretty popular. But even if I go in here and I go to like edit one of these sounds, I've got right here, I've got four sliders, and you can see right where the envelope setting is for the amplitude or like the volume. But like I was mentioning, you can also control the filter with, in this case, a separate envelope. Uh, on this other plugin, <clears throat> on the one that I was just playing around with, it's actually controlled by the same envelope. You don't have two separate ones to be able to control the filter one way and the, the volume another way. But I'll demonstrate really quick what it would do if you were trying to create a sound and play with uh, the filter control from an envelope standpoint. So you'll hear what I'm talking about. If I turn up the amount that the envelope is, is affecting the filter, now it's going to be like really exaggerated, but you'll hear not just the volume doing certain things, you'll hear the filter opening up with a certain amount of attack time, then decaying down to a certain sustain level, like where the cutoff would re kind of reside after you've held the note long enough. And then the release time being as long as it takes for it, the filter to completely close back off. Let me do this. It'll be more exaggerated if I pull it down to start. Hear how the filter is like, 
is really drastically. It's opening up and then closing. It's not just volume that's happening. You hear the brightness kick in from the filter opening with the attack time, then decaying back down to a low sustain level. Kind of a funky sound, but to demonstrate like what's going on there, the filter is now doing the same action that the volume itself is doing. Make sense? Tracking with me? Does anybody have questions about this stuff? Or is everybody good? Cool. So yeah, that's like, in general, understanding that stuff is the quickest way to get you to a place where you can start shaping your pad sounds. So, you know, when I get back to like my normal pad stack of things, you end up with something that is like, that has definition to it because it comes in with a fast enough attack, but it's got kind of a nice long trail that you would want at least long enough to where it, it can connect and smooth out your playing. Uh, wrong one, sorry. That last patch was real loud, sorry. But you end up with something that's like, that has no definition to it, has nice connectedness to it, like from, from the release time, helping ga like close that gap of when you change chords. And that's kind of like a place that you can end up with. I'm running obviously like some effects on a couple of those, like I've got different things going on there, but you get the idea, like with a little bit of reverb on a sound like that and some, like maybe some EQ to help get rid of a little bit of the mud in it, just so that it doesn't build up too much in the low end, that kind of stuff, you end up with a pretty decent pad sound. Um, that's like a quick like little, I guess, piece of the sound design part of kind of like what we do as keys players. Um, I also would say that last bit that I mentioned, knowing how to, how to control uh, the mud on your sounds is going to be pretty important, especially if you are dialing in a good bit of reverb, just being aware of when you might need to cut out a little bit of like the, the low or low mid or even sometimes just like mid region of certain sounds to keep it from building up and kind of feeding back on itself or whatever and getting to a place where it's just this like messy, muddy kind of thing is going to be important. Um, so, one other quick example of this is when I play the song Real Love, I always, like, I always thought it was kind of fun to try and actually play um, the actual like, synth sounds on that song instead of just letting the track take it. Um, so it's that really plucky kind of thing. Sorry, I know my volumes are all over the place. I haven't pulled up some of these patches in a long time. But you get the idea, this is like a nice plucky sound with some delay on it. But what I would do when I would play this song is like I would kind of start from this place. And you can kind of get through that section of the song. But then when the time comes, when you get to like the big sections, I kind of wanted to be able to use that sound, but almost more of like a nice bright synthy, more of like a pad function. So really what I actually did is I just mapped the sustain. Again, this is coming, uh, this sound is coming from the same plugin I was just talking about. What I did is I mapped the sustain on the envelope to one of my faders. So you can see it moving in main stage, but you also see what it's doing in the plugin itself. It's just moving the S up and down. So at the beginning of the song, I want it plucky like that. And that's nice for that part of the song. But then when I got to the chorus, I didn't want to be playing, you know, like I wanted to be able to add to the sustain of like what's happening as it opens up. So like, that doesn't necessarily feel big at all because it's not filling any space. So all I do is I just bring the sustain up of the sound and all of a sudden you end up with kind of more of like a pad-like, it's very synthy still, but it serves more of a pad-like function. And normally I would kick on a little bit of the chorus just to give the sound some character and motion. And it's like, I mean, it's still very synthy, very like, very much like an in-your-face kind of sound, but you can literally take like a pluck sound and just play with the envelope on it in the middle of the song and all of a sudden you've got like something that fills space, becomes more of like a nice big fat pad sound. You can still play with the cutoff on the sound, on the filter, like if you wanted to control that part of it, if it got to a section where you didn't want it to maybe cut so much, like as the pluck sound, you can maybe just dial it back. Like you have all of these parameters like at your fingertips to be able to manipulate the sound on the fly if you need to. Or maybe if you were using that sound as a pad. And all of a sudden you have kind of like a nice darker version of the same sound. Make sense? 
So these are ways that you can use parameters that basically will come, I mean, even if you were using a Nord and you're using it for its built-in functions, I think the stage series, <clears throat> sometimes it'll have an envelope section that maybe doesn't have all four parameters, like A, D, S, and R. Sometimes you'll have a keyboard that might have attack, decay, and then a release time. You don't always need like the S. Um, but sometimes like the decay and release will be like a co-mapped parameter where like you can turn the decay and the release up at the same time or both down at the same time. There will always be some form though of an envelope generator on board. Even if you go back to like old classic synths, like old Moog stuff or like mini Moog or Moog, however you want to say it. They have, I think I might have an example of one of those in here just for the sake of showing you what it looks like. Let me show you like what an old um, mini Moog kind of thing would look like. Let's do this. Come on. This is kind of like what you would see like an, on an old monophonic keyboard kind of thing or like an old synth. But even right here you see, here's the filter envelope section uh, and then the bottom is, uh, or well, one of them applies to the filter, one of them applies to like the volume section. So again, same concept, different kind of plugin. This emulates like an old Mini Moog Model D, uh, but it, you can either, like on this plugin, you could turn on whether or not the decay knob controls the release time or not. So that sometimes they might look a little different. These are knobs, not faders, but it's the same concept. You can control the sound just like you would on an old analog synth compared to like, you know, Omnisphere has the same kind of thing. So knowing how to get to that stuff and what it does to shape the sound is, is pretty like, is pretty important for sound design stuff. Uh, I think maybe I'll show you one more. I'll show you the fun stuff and then I want to use the rest of the time just to like try to answer any other like questions you guys might have. Um, and it can cover like your questions can be anything like for anything we've talked about. Uh, actually, and before I get to that last thing, the other thing I meant to mention about the drone concept, again, maybe some of you guys are already doing this, but to show you kind of how it adds to the flexibility of what you're doing, going back to those first three questions I talked about, um, I, honestly, like the drone thing to me adds, it adds consistency and adds flexibility to your rig because one, I think one of the things that as keyboard players we all start to sweat over would be transitions. Like transitions can be pretty hard sometimes knowing you, you are like the sole person responsible for going from one key to another while also firing a track and also changing a patch and doing like 10 other things basically. It can get a little crazy. And that's one of my favorite uses of the drone, like the droning pad kind of concept is that it allows super easy song transitions. Um, so I'll show you like if I was going from, let's say I was playing in C and I wanted to go from C to the key of D. And let me bring the pad back in. That's another quick side note I forgot to mention is you can, like I was saying about using the cutoff on the filter of a pad for kind of like your, the equivalent of your dynamic control of the pad. You can go from bright to dark and then all the way down if you want, like I have this set up so that the cutoff actually kills, it ends up cutting out the entire audio of the pad sound. So it's actually also a little bit of like a volume control for me. If I, want it, if I want to play a different pad sound through my pad bus, but I don't want my stock pad in it, I'll just pull the cutoff all the way down and then that way I can play a different pad sound and it's, I don't have to worry about bringing this fader up and still having the old stock pad in it. Make sense? So let's say, let's say I was playing in the key of C. What I'll do a lot of times at the end of a song, and I'm sure a lot of you guys are again familiar with this, but I'll get it like, kind of like a droning pad going in the key of D, if that was my next song. And let's say I was wrapping up the song here. So I've already got the new key going on the drone pad. It takes a little bit of like finger dexterity to do this. Like what I'll do is right now you can still hear the sustain of the piano and like the layered pad, but I'll just pull those two down while I pull the latch pad up or the drone pad. And you, like you basically do a little manual crossfade when it gets all the way down. I'll switch over on the piano and pad, like the, the sound I'm playing. And if I need to change patches, like you can do that really quick. If I have it MIDI mapped, I could hit like one button and all of a sudden I'm on a different patch. It actually didn't do anything, but you get the idea. 
normally it works, but it's not right now. But it, like I would, once it got all the way down, I would get the new key going, change my right, like my layered pad sound, and then just bring them back in, and now all of a sudden I'm in the key of D. So it's a really easy way to kind of get yourself from like, from one key to another. It helps create like a nice glue consistency. You can do some crossfading, and it gets you in and out of keys really easily. Does that make sense? I don't know if you guys have ever used like that kind of thing to do that, but it can be a really helpful tool when you feel like you're the only person making a, a key change happen. Um, the other side note on that too is it can also be something if you're going from one key to a related key. Let's say I was going from C to F and I had the latch pad going in C. The nice thing about like a droning kind of pad thing is that it also, in a sense, glues you to where the one chord is. So like because it is kind of droning around those two friendly voices in the key, if I change that, let's say I was, again, going from C to F. So if I change that latch pad while I'm still here and I bring up the mix just enough of it to where it starts to feel a little bit like now there's some tension like in the key that we're in, Like all of a sudden it kind of feels like the one chord has shifted because the latched pad was like kind of creating a little bit of like the tension to where the new key was going to be. And then when you resolve to it, all of a sudden it kind of feels like your new home base just by the fact that you were changing to like a different kind of droning like sound behind it. The, like where the one chord is feels like home all of a sudden, even though you just switched to like what was the four chord, all of a sudden it feels like the one chord. Does that kind of make sense? So you can use it like that too. Um, all right, the last fun little thing I wanted to talk about. This is something that's brand new, like as far as something that I figured out. Uh, so one of the things that keyboard players always struggle with is if you want to try to do more of like a tempo synced sound. Um, obviously, like arpeggiation, like arpeggiating sounds are really popular right now. Um, even you know side chaining is a big deal. Like um, for those of you familiar with the concept, the idea is that. If you run a compressor on a sound, but you trigger the compression from a different source. So normally, like if I'm running compression on a piano sound, it's the level of the piano going into the compressor that the compressor is responding to. You can switch it so that the compressor isn't actually responding to the audio of what's coming through it, but is actually responding to the audio from somewhere else. So the most popular version of this would be like side chaining to a kick drum like if you're if it's like a dancey song and there's like a kick drum hitting on each beat sometimes like you'll have that pulsing feeling where like when the kick drum hits everything they usually use the term ducks out of the way because this the compression on whatever the sound is is kicking in from that input source on the side chain so the kick when the kick drum hits the compressor is reacting to that instead but it's compressing the sound that's running through the compressor make sense kind of that's my best way of describing that. That's how you get that sound where it kind of feels like the sound is pulsing with the beat. Uh, you have sounds like that, or you might have sounds that kind of like, and maybe like don't even have necessarily the side chain motion to them. That kind of sounds like it ducks out of the way and then kicks back in. You can also have pulsing sounds that actually would like maybe pulse with the beat instead of being like kind of swelling back in the way that side chaining does. Um, so recently, the problem is that you can have patches, you can create things with different plugins, maybe Omnisphere or something, where you can have that kind of motion, but it's really hard to play them live because you have to play so in time, right on the beat, that if you're off at all, all of a sudden you have this tempo sync stuff, it's at the right tempo maybe, but it's, but it's not on the grid, like you're not playing on the same exact like where the beat is falling with the rest of like your tracks and your band. And so it ends up being like a huge hassle and a, like a really difficult thing to try and line those things up without some extra help. Well, recently, and I can't even take credit for this, one of the guys who plays for, uh, for Bethel, Luke Hendrickson, I've seen like some videos of him talking about some of his rig. He does use Ableton for keys, um, but I kind of took his concept and applied it to main stage. So, and I, like this is the first time I've ever really done it or tried it, but it works really pretty well. The concept is that you have, um, I'm not going to go too into detail on how to set up unless you have questions about it, but you can send MIDI from your tracks computer 
Or again, if you're running tracks and keys from the same computer, it's even easier because you don't really have to send the MIDI from computer to computer. You can just kind of send it to itself. Um, but what I've got going, and I know you can't see this, but it's literally just a note that like, if I were to fire a track, um, and you'll hear the click going, but all that this MIDI channel is doing is sending one note on the, on the quarter note. So it's just sending a note that plays on each beat. The important thing to remember is that that means that it's in sync with the beat of where Ableton is, which means that's where our tracks would be. Everybody, I'm assuming, is using tracks for the most part, or at least click like where you're at. Maybe if you're not even the one running your tracks or running click or whatever, you could still set this up on that computer and apply the same idea. So all I've got is I've got looping MIDI just playing one note. It's playing C3 because that's what I picked. And it's sending that to this computer via MIDI cable, like from the interface of this one to the interface of my keys computer. You still tracking with me? So this computer is receiving MIDI. And I'll show you. You'll hear click come through when I fire this. But you're also going to see on the display, it might be a little lagged. But you'll see up there. One. Two, See how three, C3 is flashing four. on and off at 100, like the velocity I just set to 100? So what I've done is like it's at least showing you that main stage is receiving that MIDI. And what I did is I mapped the MIDI that's coming from that in my layout like tab, which you could do this in whatever you use. But I've mapped it just to this top keyboard. Like it's responding to that. I don't know if you can see that little key moving up and down right there. So it's playing that key every time that this MIDI clip in Ableton is sending it to main stage. So all I had to do is map that first. But then now what I can do over here is I've actually created two synth sounds on that like fake little virtual keyboard that I created. And over here, I've got two for different purposes. But they're not the audio from them is not going anywhere. This is another important thing to realize is that you only want to use this kind of thing on something that maybe isn't going to use a ton of processing power to do. So what I did is I picked one of the simplest, like this is like a piece of junk plugin that comes with Logic, basically. But it's a synth sound, and it's like the lowest processing heavy one. I just picked one that I knew would be really slim on how much processing it would eat up. Um, this is another friendly thing about main stage is that you can open up, you can actually see a graph of how much each plugin is using on processing power. Um, Reverbs tend to be a little bit on like the heavier side. Sometimes like your like Omnisphere is a pretty CPU heavy um, plugin. You can see that kind of stuff. But what you'll see is like as I'm running this this plugin, which is the ESM, this, like I guess it's the slightly darker red guy. It's only using a couple percent as far as like this the processing part of it goes, which is really nice. So basically, what I'm having this do is this is playing a synth on the beat is all it's doing. The audio, as you can see, I've set to not go anywhere. It's playing it, but it's not doing anything. One, if you wanted to hear it, this is what it sounds like. Four. That's all it's doing, is it's just playing a synth that just has like a quick little like pluck to it. Now, the reason I'm showing you this is because that sound is what I'm going to use to sidechain my pad to. Make sense? So that's synced up with the beat. And then all I have to do is run a compressor on my pad bus. And I'll give you like a nice bright pad to show you, like really demonstrate what's going on. Um, so nice bright pad. What I've done is here's my pad bus over here. I've got a compressor on it that's, again, it's not doing anything. But what I've done is I've sidechained it to that channel strip, which I just named sidechain this so I could find it really easily. And so it's listening to that input, but right now the ratio of how much I'm compressing the pad is set down, it's set to one to one, which means it's not compressing at all. But if I play with the ratio, all of a sudden it starts to react to the side chained input, and I can get more side chain out of it if I really want to kick it all the way up or dial it back down. So here's the pad sound with no side chaining. And then as I kick this in, you'll hear it start to pulse with the downbeat. Kind of nice, right? So the thing that's awesome about that is I don't even have to worry about my playing anymore. My pad sound is actually just side chained literally to the beat of where our tracks are. And I don't even have to like worry about playing in time. Like it's always gonna be that way. I could come in like completely out of time, but it's always gonna be side chained to that same beat.
which is pretty awesome, right? Like as far as like trying to do like tempo sync stuff, it's pretty like it's a pretty handy little trick. Um, the other thing that you can do, similar concept, but you can use uh, what like you can use a gate. Which if you're familiar with what a gate is, it basically is something. A lot of times you'll use it on maybe like drums or a certain instrument where you wanna you don't want the audio to come through because there's a certain level there's a certain noise floor associated with co what's coming through the mic. So maybe there's like you might gate like a snare drum. Uh, so that like as you're playing like cymbals and playing kick drum, like before you hit the snare, you're not getting all that bleed through the mic. But then the gate opens up based on the amount of signal flowing through the gate. So when you hit the snare drum, you obviously want that to pass through. That's kind of the concept with a gate. But you can do the same thing with a gate as you would do with a compressor, which is you can side chain the gate to open up to an alternate source. So I'm doing the same kind of thing, and you can set like a I'm setting basically the same synth sound to respond to or to open up the gate on the pad. So I'm running this on the pad bus. And what I will do is like as I'm dialing this in, I'm basically just going to crank up the amount of, it's funny because I'm turning the knob up because I liked thinking of it as the amount of reduction I'm getting. But if I, if I leave the knob all the way down, or in this case it looks all the way up, you're getting no reduction. If I turn the knob up, I'm getting more and more reduction and you'll hear kind of what that sounds like uh, in just a second. I'm actually going to set this uh, to more of like an eighth note pulse so that it's like as far as the tempo goes. Um, and that's the beauty of it is that since this is coming from tracks, it's really easy to create MIDI clips that are doing different things. So if maybe for a song you want the side chaining to happen to even, you could do it with a specific rhythm. It may not even be to the quarter note. I can just draw in MIDI notes on here for whatever rhythm I want it to either side chain to or pulse to. So you could even have it different per song, that kind of thing. Um, and even if you're not using Ableton to run tracks, you could do this in Logic or Pro Tools or whatever random thing you might choose to use. As long as you can send MIDI, you could do this. Um, so I've set it to send MIDI at eighth notes, and this is kind of what the gating thing can do. It can create more of like a more of a pulsing thing, One, almost more of like two, a corded arpeggiation three, kind of thing. Four. So I'll dial it in. So you can you can end up with more of like a pulsing effect if you want, and you can. You can play with the amount of it if you want. So there's kind of like a little bit of a pulsing effect if I want, just by changing how much the gate is, is how much reduction the gate is adding to the pad. And then I can also dial in, if I wanted to pair that with side chaining, you could do the same thing, which is kind of the beauty of it. Does that make sense? I know this is like throwing a lot, but if with tempo sync stuff, that's basically creating like an arpeggiated patch that is automatically synced with the beat. Uh, so like, no matter at what time I play in, it's always going to be in time with the tracks, which is pretty awesome. It might be lagging just a little bit um, because of, you know, the amount of time for my computer to process everything that's happening. But in my opinion, it's close enough to where it makes it not like nearly as hard to try and always be playing directly in time and syncing that stuff up with the grid. And you could also play with parameters on that kind of stuff, you could actually probably add some, uh, you could play with like the delay on when this is sitting and all that kind of stuff. But does that make sense? Kind of crazy. I know. Were you about to ask something about it? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. That was the last thing that I was going to like kind of cover as far as handy little, I guess, topics and notes and stuff like that. So, so yeah. What questions do you guys have, if you have any? Like I said, I really feel like I can't Hello? take credit for that idea. That was something I saw from Luke Hendrickson from Bethel, and he's he's amazing. So, but that's where I got the idea from. <laughs> Don't touch him. That's on. Hello. Questions. What's I have the mic, so I'm going to start. Yeah, go for it. Um, so one question I have is how do you how do you personally approach your in ear mix so that you're getting a, a really good feedback loop so you're not like overcompensating or undercompensating, et cetera? Yeah. Man, that's a good question. Uh, the best thing I can say 
especially if you guys, I don't know if you guys typically are MDing. Um, like, uh, if you are, like, if you are music directing on a Sunday, which I, I'm maybe not everybody's even familiar with, like, I think maybe everybody's familiar with the concept of, like, an MD, but if you're kind of the person responsible for the overall picture of what's happening, it's going to be really important for you to be able to really, like, hear a good idea of what the band as a whole sounds like. Um, you know, my best... Like, I always try to picture the mix that I would go for is basically being my closest idea of what front of house mix would sound like. I always want to make sure I, I have enough lead vocal to really hear if, like, our worship leader is on or going a different direction or doing something different. Um, but really just, like, a nice, even mix of everything, maybe just with, like, with myself bumped just a little bit. Um, it's It's so easy to want to have more of yourself than you need. Um, but the more comfortable you get like away from that blanket of being able to hear everything of yourself super well, uh, the advantage of that is you stop playing like all you hear is yourself. Um, so the best part about that is that all of a sudden you start to realize when maybe you're conflicting with like an electric guitar part is because you actually can hear him nice and well and all of a sudden it's like, whoa, what I'm playing and what he's playing do not match right now. Whereas if you're kind of always overwhelming everything else in your mix, you're never going to pick up on that. Um, one other quick thing that I would say as far as mixes go is I I tend to not, I guess I've gotten to a place where maybe I trust, um, I, I trust and know I know what's in tracks enough to where I don't want to have to have a lot of them in my mix to rely on them. And my personal preference is I also would prefer, like, I would typically prefer for a front of house mix to not necessarily be super track heavy, just so that if we do go off the grid and we do something different, that all of a sudden the bottom doesn't drop out of your mix because, and again, I'm not a front house engineer, but I like to think of it that way so that as a band, we don't ever have to feel like our dynamics and our strengths relying totally on what this computer is doing. So if we get off or do something different, basically what I'm saying is I try to reflect that in my mix. I don't want my mix to ride and die on if there's tracks going on. So if we're playing a song and we just don't need the track for it, I don't want it to feel like my mix is really, uh, is like thin and not full just because we don't have a track. Like to me, it'll end up feeling like it's just as strong as the ones that we have tracks for. There's just maybe a little less like information happening, but my mix still feels full and feels strong. I'd rather hear all of the live stuff more than like what's going on here, so. And that doesn't get too muddy, like too much track and keyboard together. Uh, I mean, it, you know, it can, like being aware of what's in the tracks is going to be really important. So if you know that there's a part, you know, maybe doubling stuff in a track isn't always a bad idea, but if it's like, if there's tons of pad stuff going on in a track and that's basically all you're doing is putting a ton of pad on something, then, you know, it might get to be a little too much. Um, so, it, I mean, it just, there's give and take there, but yeah, it can, it can, Sometimes I think that's like a problem is when there's tons of pad stuff in a track and ton of pad stuff coming from you. It just ends up being so much that they're gonna have to like control you from back there. So being aware of what's there is gonna be important too. Cool. Okay, my next question. <laughs> uh, what's your mindset around when you're learning a new song? And I mean, there's a whole range of keys, sounds, and whatnot. But what's your? How do you? How do you approach that in a, in a good way? Yeah, that's a great question. So, I mean, a good place to start would be realizing what kind of sounds you need, like from the get-go. So, you know, I mean, if it's a piano-based song, knowing what kind of piano sound to go for, uh, you know, knowing what kind of settings. It's good to have a session like this where maybe it's big enough to where you can kind of roll in uh, and have a good starting place for just about any kind of song. So if I know I'm going to play something that's like pretty synthy, I know I can maybe start from... It's not always the best idea because maybe you'll never end up with very many new sounds, but especially if you're in a pinch and it's like, hey, we're going to play this song and it's a super synthy one, but all you got pulled up is like a couple dark pianos or something, you're going to be kind of like hosed. Um, but when I'm learning a new song, like, of course, the form is going to be important, like, just learning the arrangement. Uh, for me, I pay attention a lot to what the other instruments are doing, too. Like, understanding what the drums are supposed to be doing dynamically to a song helps me out a ton. Um, and then knowing all of the, like, learning the vocal melody and learning the hooks, even if it's not a hook that you're going to play, is going to be, like, the most important part. Aside from the chords and knowing, like, bar for bar what the arrangement's doing, 
even if it's a guitar hook that you don't play on, like know the hook and know what the lead vocal's doing so that you're, like I was referencing earlier, you're playing, you always want to do something that's going to work with the lead melody, like the vocal melody of the song. So knowing it is going to be important. Um, and then aside from that, like ear training is going to be your best friend. So being able to listen to a song and just by listening to it, know, okay, there's the four, there's the six, there's the five, whatever it might be. And then also like having enough ear training to know like if there is a hook in it to where you don't have to sit at a piano to figure it out. It's like, okay, if you're thinking in scalar degrees, it's like, you know, knowing that reckless love is one, 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 seven, 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 six, six, five, three helps you be able to, like, you can walk in and be like, hey, all right, we're going to play that song in E flat, and then boom, you can play it because you're not depending on note names. You know what scalar degree the hook is in. Make sense? Mm -hmm. um, that kind of stuff is going to be, like, that's kind of my process for it, is I'll just listen to it and then figure out where all that stuff is. How do you determine what's in a track and what's something you want to play live? Oh, man, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, you know, typically anything that's piano, I, like, I will play. Anything that's piano, like, I'll play. It's, like, obviously, if it's a piano-based song. Um, but, you know, if it's, if it's something that's maybe a little more synthy or, like, a little more aggressive, um, you know, like, I, it helps to, if maybe if you're not the person that is setting up the track session, like, maybe you could ask for, like, I always encourage our volunteers to like let me know like if they want to know what's in the track like I can send them a bounce of it really easily so that it's like oh like I can hear this is there and this isn't or like what maybe would help for me to fill some space on or contribute to and whatnot to uh, typically though I would say all of this tempo sync stuff aside it's generally safer to let the track take like if there's a really important arpeggiated part from a synth sound or something it's gonna be a little safer to let the track take that stuff um, you can still have a setup like this where you can dial in some tempo sync stuff, but in general, if there's like a really like gridded up, arpeggiated sound, it's better to let the track take it in general, I would say. Um, but anything lead, any hook, any like prominent part, it just always seems phony to me when there's piano in a track. So like if there's piano in a song, play the piano stuff, you know? Um, <laughs> And then like, if you're not sure from a pad standpoint, like having a good go-to one is a great place to start. And then if you feel like maybe there's some other, you know, knowing like, oh, maybe like a nice big, like, you know, pipe organ sound on this one would be a, like a really great option. Something that can kind of like, you know, like knowing what kind of textures maybe you'd want to bring in here and there uh, is also like, can be helpful. You know, it's like, oh, this song has a little bit of more like that grandiose kind of feel to it. So maybe a sound like that would help contribute to the sonic scape of the song. Whereas maybe on like a young and free song, you know, a pipe organ would make no sense. <laughs> like, yeah. it just wouldn't really fit. So I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah. You may have already <clears throat> touched on this earlier, but um, could you give us an example of like, both from a just like padding perspective, but also maybe with some piano, maybe give both options. What you would normally do under a talking point in a, in a gathering, if the yeah, pastor's yeah. talking, it's maybe, and also even like variations based on if it's more lighthearted, like announcements, and then like if it's more of a serious moment, like communion or. Yeah, yeah. that's a great question. Um, so, yeah. I would say understanding, like thinking of yourself as being like basically like a live film scoring person or like you're basically like somebody who's sitting in front. Like if you were to picture yourself like on the opposite side of what's happening and imagining there being something underscoring the moment, that's going to be your best perspective. So honestly, I know it sounds kind of silly, but like being in a place where you don't have to pay a whole lot of attention to what you're playing because you're listening to what's happening is going to be the is going to be your best friend. So honestly like when I'm underscoring things I'm not thinking a whole lot about what I'm playing. I mean you want it to have purpose. Um, but I'm not going to be like super dialed into specifically what I'm playing because really what I'm dialed into is where this where whoever's talking what they're talking about where they're going with what they're talking about. You want to be able to anticipate like Oh, like this story, you know, every story is going to have like rising action and like a, like some kind of conflict or then a resolution later, like knowing, especially like if a pastor's wrapping up and he's telling a story, maybe to close stuff like that, knowing 
what kind of progressions from a theory standpoint to sit in that maybe have a little more tension in them or have like less of uh, less of like a resolution to them until the moment that he, you feel like he's landing a plane on a concept and then you kind of resolve your chord progressions a little more, that stuff will be helpful. So for example, this is one example. So obviously don't take this as like a, this is what I'm gonna play every time I do this kind of stuff. But like if, um, well, let me go all the way back to the start. Like if I'm starting off, um, if it's like the end of a, of a sermon or something and I'm kind of the person responsible for padding and playing underneath, what I'll do is like I'll, I'm just gonna play and see for now. I'll usually get like a, the droning kind of pad going and then get the layered one going too, but pull the piano out. This is my starting process. I'll kind of start here. I'll creep in with like my master fader. So everything's in other than the piano right now and I'm just bringing my whole volume up kind of start adding in like simple stuff. You don't want to kind of come in guns blazing with like tons of low end or tons of high end. You want to start pretty filtered out too because the like the frequency of like the human voice is going to be most, I don't know, probably intelligible in like that mid range, like you're kind of like 2K-ish range. So filtering out a lot of the frequencies that would compete with that is going to be important so that you can understand what the person's saying. So you're kind of like playing along here. You kind of maybe start to establish a really simple like progression with a little bit of motion. And what I'm doing too, this is something I'll do a lot, is going back to what I was saying earlier from a playing standpoint, voicings will be your best friend. Knowing how to keep your hand from jumping around a lot is gonna make your, is gonna be the least noticeable thing happening. That You don't wanna be the thing that's noticed. You wanna be the thing that's just enhancing what's happening. So knowing how to kind of connect all of your voicings, keeping your hand from having to jump around, playing different chords, but also keep it interesting where it's conveying emotion and, and conveying like going along with what's happening. So I'll kind of be doing this kind of thing, keeping it relatively in the middle of the keyboard, that kind of stuff. And then at a certain point, you know, I might start to creep in a little bit of like piano. I'll pull my piano fader most of the way up so that it's obvious that it's there, but it doesn't come in guns blazing when I want it to. And I'll maybe start with some like single notes. And all of a sudden, like nobody's gonna notice like, oh, there's a new sound there if you kind of sneak it in. So like this is really simple, but it's just enough to kind of like be going on underneath something, right? And then so now I'm in all the way, like my volumes are kind of back to where they normally would be. I don't need to be, like if we were gonna go into a song, I don't need to all of a sudden be like and like push everything forward. You can trust for in a house to control you if you need to get all the way up to where your normal volume would be. Um, and then it's from like a progression standpoint, I do this a lot. If it's like a, a talking point where maybe somebody's telling a story or there's maybe like, I don't know, maybe a little more tension in what's happening. I stay away a little bit from the one chord. So like the one chord feels like resolution. Like all of a sudden it feels like a point has been made, like a concept has been landed. And in general, like the major chords in the key are gonna sound a little happier by nature. Like that's just the nature of a major chord versus like kind of the somberness of like a, of minor chords. So a lot of times here's a good example is I'll play a progression that has motion but stays away from resolution until I want it to, is like a four, six, five, and then maybe like one over three, and then just loop back to the four. So like this is, this progression never feels like it lands anywhere. It kind of just is like in this looping spot of, like it's nice, it conveys like, that there's some kind of like, it's, there's progression to it, but it's not too like resolving. Uh, and then maybe at a certain point, like there's a turning point in the story where like, C like kind of makes a good like point and then all of a sudden you can kind of like resolve a little bit and it's nice and you can bring back a little more tension like bringing like a six chord in. Do you know what I mean? Like you can play around with the emotion of what's happening just by what chords you pick. So like the resolution of a one chord feels awesome when somebody's making like an important point or something like or they've just landed the plane a little bit. Um, versus that other progression I was playing that has motion to it, but doesn't ever really resolve. Like there's a little bit of like, you're still just sitting in something, you know what I mean? So knowing how progressions work and how to like use them to convey certain emotions is like, will be your best friend. Make sense? I don't know if that helps at all, but that's like my process for playing underneath somebody.
I wasn't lying. Um, so one that I found kind of difficult to decipher is how much freedom and what's kind of your sandbox for creative movement? Because uh, like you said, it's percussive. And so you can get really cheesy and or really just like, man, there's the keyboard. Um, but you still want to have kind of that f creative freedom and be able to move around and not just hit, you know, blocking chords out all the time. What's your approach to that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, again, it depends on the song, uh, but, you know, I would say in general, um, I think most of, from my experience, mo including myself, my tendency as a keyboard player is to overplay. Um, understanding how to use space, especially in like how you're playing is, is gonna be like really useful too. So a lot of times in songs, you're not necessarily gonna add to the dynamic of a song when it's really big, at least like not a ton by just doing this kind of thing where it's like if it's big and you're kind of like and you're just like kind of hammering away, like playing tons of stuff, it might get a little, it just can be like easy to overplay. Whereas if you use some of these concepts to actually, as opposed to trying to fill all that space, knowing that you've got tons of sustain from the piano sound because it's got compression running on it, you don't need to keep reattacking all the time because it's already going to be nice and present through the whole sustain of the chord. And it doesn't mean you can't reattack chords. But and then also using like your pad sound to fill space. So like maybe and dialing in a little bit of reverb, all that kind of stuff is gonna make it so that you don't need to always overplay all the time to fill that space. You can use other tools like at your disposal to fill that space. So like kind of what I just did versus like using these big fat chords, like if you're playing, you know, so will I, you're at the end of the song. What you might see me doing honestly might just look like this. Uh, uh, Like honestly, just letting like a lot of the sustain do the work. Like as opposed to if I was like just like way over playing and just like. Like you're kind of just like losing all of it, like a big kind of like messy, but like thing that isn't going to help anybody out. Yeah. Um, and you know, knowing when to branch out like is, is it's not a bad thing to branch out and like play some parts. Uh, I like one simple little tip or trick, I guess, would be like find gaps in the vocal. Like again, the vocal is going to be really important. It doesn't mean you can't play like parts while the vocal's happening. Uh, but a lot of times, I will look for gaps when like maybe there isn't a vocal, and maybe I've communicated with the guitar player like I might put parts in those gaps to put interesting things where there is no lead vocal. Um, you know, so what would be a good example? Are you talking about like? Are you talking about like the turn of a phrase or something like that? If there isn't like a yeah. guitar, right? Or Sorry. even like, um, like what would be a good? I'm trying to think of where did my oh there is. Uh, I'm trying to remember if I had a good example of like a song that maybe. Well, you know, so like a song like. I guess this is Amazing Grace, there's a part where the vocal, it doesn't happen. So like it, if you were playing a lead synth sound, it kind of does that, which I don't have a good example of one now, so I'll just play piano. But if it was, this is Amazing Grace, it has that synth sound that goes. This is and that part's happening in the gap every time. That you would take And it's all happening like where it's an interesting thing to, to keep you going where there is no vocal. Uh, so look for stuff like that. You know, maybe it's not in the recorded version of a song, but if you want to branch out, I try to find times to branch out when it can be an intentional part that I've picked, like that's not going to compete with that. And maybe there's no specific part happening there. You can come to life a little bit and branch out. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's my best advice. <laughs> uh, it's okay. What are we gonna ask? Well, yeah, I'll just 
say like if so you have a lot of different sounds running. So is there any way you could pull up a like a actual main stage patch pad and manipulate that so that we could see how to do something if we didn't have a lot of your Extra, plugins? Like yeah. third party stuff? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um Yeah, that's a good question and it you know, this is literally me just going a little on the fly. But this would be my process. A lot of times uh, I would start from, let me pull this one out. I would, the place that I start from, honestly presets aren't a bad thing. Like I would start from a place where you can kind of find something that gets you close and then get the rest of the way there just by like, by manipulating a preset that gets you close to begin with. Um, shoot, I don't know, let's go with, uh, let's go with, Retro synth. I was thinking the same thing. So if I was just like playing around, <laughs> again, this is me just fiddling around with stuff, but let me try to find like a good starting point. It's not a bad place to start. So literally this is me just pulling up stock stuff. Uh, honestly, like the, uh, the envelope settings on this would work well for a pad. It's maybe a little bright, maybe a little synthy to begin with. Like I would maybe, it's hard for me to tell too by listening out there, but you could maybe cut a little bit of like the brightness out of it. And I would high pass it just to get rid of in case there's any like super low stuff that would just end up being really muddy. I'd maybe start with like killing stuff that's maybe under like 50 Hertz. Maybe cut just like a little bit of low mid stuff. I do that a lot too, just to keep it from building up. Let me tighten this up so it kills a little bit more of the brightness specifically. So I just threw a little bit of EQ on it. Maybe I would go like uh, the built-in like reverbs. Space Designer is great, but it uses a lot of processing. And for you guys that are using main stage, maybe like something like Silververb is a lower CPU heavy kind of thing. Uh, <clears throat> let's see, let's start with a preset. Maybe just go with like a hall preset, see what that sounds like. Give it a little bit of like a tail. Let me also pull the cutoff back on this. And then what I would do is probably go here, can map the cutoff to the mod wheel on the keyboard, go into retro synth, go filter, cutoff. That way if I wanted to be able to make it bright in the middle of the song, Got like a nice good bit of brightness if you wanted to get there. It's got a good tail on it. Even that is like a pretty decent starting point. I yeah. mean, it, like if you want something that's usable and you didn't know where to start, like to me that works. Yeah. It's not bad. I'm actually surprised how good that sounds. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't hate it either. Like yeah. it's not bad. I mean, it's like it's nice and bright when you want it to be and For like our last little question, um, resources, like if you were to say, hey, here's some places I would go look um, online or YouTube, yeah. whatever. I just took a bite of cookie, sorry. <laughs> um, I would go, uh, so I, the resource I was mentioning earlier, when I kind of learned about this like tempo syncing stuff, um, productiononline.com is something that like I've discovered uh, it's primarily like a group of guys from Bethel. Um, but they actually have some really helpful like video courses on there. And there's videos actually on a lot of different things. Uh, but one of them is like a keyboard rig overview from Lou Kendrickson, who's like the Bethel guy. He's, I think he's phenomenal at what he does. I don't know him personally, but when I, every time I hear him play and like hear the stuff that he does, I think it's awesome. Um, so he has, like you can pay, it's not free, but you can pay per course. Uh, if you want access to like individual courses or you can pay like a monthly subscription to be able to access all of their videos, which they have a lot. Um, that's one resource. Peter James is another great resource. Like he, 
I mean, YouTube will be your best friend in general, but there are videos that Peter James has done of like, he's done master classes at Hillsong before. Um, also, if you go to multitracks.com, they sell patch bundles and that kind of stuff, which I was talking with some of you guys like about that at one point, but you know, use that for as much as it's worth. Don't let that be a crutch, like to just depend on everybody else's patches, but, um, but it's a good place to start and a good place to get really great sounds for pretty cheap. Uh, so Peter James sells some of his own patches on multitracks.com. Uh, like a, I think one of the Young and Free guys does. I think some people for like, uh, what's his name? Ian McIntosh, who's done stuff with Jesus Culture and Bethel. He's got stuff there. So there's like a wide variety of resources for what you can use. But yeah, learning. I mean, honestly, a lot of this stuff, like if you have a hunger for it and you want to dig far enough to just figure out how to do stuff, um, it's going to actually really just depend on your willingness to go search for it sometimes. So production online and multi-tracks and Peter James, and those are like the best ones off the top of my head, but don't be afraid to just research stuff on YouTube and go searching, you know. Not really, no. Uh, I, I've never honestly really like thought about it, but maybe I could at some point, but as of now, I don't. Um, I don't even like post on social media, honestly. I'm like, a, I'm a boring follow, so. Really quick question. So when you're playing live and you have your set, do you like to like MIDI map so that when you click the track, it brings up all your sounds? Or do you like to just have control over one doing tracks and control over one doing all of your sound, like your key sounds so that you don't have to worry about it going back and yeah. forth. I think if I was like, if I was doing like a, if I was on some kind of tour where maybe each night looked basically the same, I think it would be a great idea to have things mini mapped out like that to where when you fire a track, maybe it, it sends program changes to like your computer and your keyboards or whatever you might have so that they all change when you fire a certain song. I think it gets a little dangerous when you're talking like Sunday, like every week in and out, kind of doing that all the time. It sounds a little scary to me just because I like knowing that I can literally just hit a button and change patches, which again, I don't know why that button's not working now, but, but being able to literally just kind of hit a button and have it do what I like, what basically firing the track would do. Um, I prefer it that way for Sundays. So, you know, the only information I like to be sent back and forth from tracks to keys is, if it's something like tempo synced, or if I just don't have enough hands to do what I was gonna do. I've also automated parameters from tracks too. Just the way that I mini mapped that keyboard to play a synth sound on the, like on the quarter note or whatever it is I'm sending from here. You can also MIDI map, you know, sending other like CC values from one computer to another and then map that to like, that's actually what I have this knob here for, is actually a tracks control knob, so if I wanted like an automated like filter to open up at a certain part of a song where I didn't have a third hand to do it, like I needed two hands to play what I'm playing. I could write it out in a MIDI envelope in Ableton and then send it to tracks and have that literally automate like a filter or automate something about a sound without me having to touch anything, which is also pretty cool. A little risky bit. Those are the only things that I tend to have tracks control keys though. I, otherwise I try to keep them pretty independent. 